My mother always said that you have to eat your vegetables before you got your dessert. And uh, you know, poetry is kind of a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> trying to hurry people along here. We are, uh, we do have a sometime constraint. <laughs> My name is Art Curtis. I'm a writer, poet, a near do well, discover. Um, but I'm very happy to be here tonight and to have the honor of introducing a really wonderful group of poets from Northern Michigan and from Central Michigan. We have uh, someone that I used to read with uh, up from, from Midland. So it's a, it's a good group. Some of the poets I know and have read their poems, others I don't know. So I'm actually looking forward to learning something something new tonight. Um, there's a couple of business things that I want to deal with. Uh, the first is the microphone. This is a very directional mic. And if you remove it from the stand, which I won't do, but you can, uh, you want to hold it here. You don't want to hold it out here or down this way or up this way. You want to talk directly into it. And, you know, you have a, a softer voice and your home requires a gentleness. It's a good idea to, to use the mic. So that's one thing. The other thing I want to mention is that uh, I, I've told some people this, but there is a group, some of you are from Traverse City, there's a group that meets on the last Monday of the month at the Mid Coast, Middle Coast Brewery, right on State Street, the old fire hall. And uh, it's called Poets and Musicians. And uh, you're welcome if you're a poet or a musician or just someone who likes to listen to poetry and music. And it's a good group. And we were, as I say, we meet on that last Monday uh, of every month. Um, Our first uh, business tonight is for me to read uh, a poem that I wrote just because it's appropriate, I think, but I left it on the table, which goes to show you that not only am I a near do well, I'm disorganized as well. <laughs> Michael, can you hand me? Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, I can probably do this poem from memory. And the only reason that I'm reading this one poem first is because I feel um, like it is appropriate for anybody who writes and who loves words. It's called I Am. I'm an old white guy, strunk on words. I lean against the lamppost of language, bumper sticker with the signage of syntax. I pick up pencil and paper, signal for a lift. Thank you. <laughs> um, our first poem, poet tonight is Michael Hughes, who claims he was lured into poetry by Emily Dix Dickinson. Now, it's my understanding that Emily Dickinson spent most of her time in her festival not out luring men, so I'm not quite <laughs> sure where this business came from. He also uh, liked the, uh, the poetry of our favorite failed farmer, Robert Frost. Um, Michael uh, published a chat, chat book in 2012 entitled 
first risings, and I believe my got some for sale over here on the table. That's the other thing I wanted to mention is that all the poets, the ones that aren't near the wells, have books for sale. I don't have a book. I'm working on one. Michael originally hailed from West Virginia, but he now lives in Benzie County. After realizing that it probably makes more sense to live in heaven than to be almost there. Michael, why not? It was nice not to have a lot of West Virginia jokes. <laughs> okay, this first poem is called I Write for Food. Poems scatter like apples in the orchard no one picked this fall. I hear them in voices of a family during foreclosure and the brash young man whose car is repossessed, the executive whose plant closes. Other poems have the grace to remain on trees, firm, sweet, reflecting sun, waiting to be picked, bitten into, droplets of juice beating the cheek. If you feed me or put gas in my tank, I'll read to you, sign this book for you, leave it on the kitchen table. If you listen to me, I'll sit and listen to you and we'll part knowing something. This next one is called In Her Own Time. Don't worry, Dad, I'll be fine. New life sprouting inside. She is tense and athletic as she grips his arm and <laughs> smiles their way to the altar. She arranged the wedding in a week. He paid the bills. Who gives this woman? He offers her hand, sits down on a rigid bench. After he wanders among strangers, guests relax their concentration. Many leave before the gifts are opened, two small boxes and a pile of cards. Someone photographs his daughter running out with her man, a small group blowing bubbles. And again, as she drives off in a silver Mustang, cans clanking, windows written in white, scandalous, no mo. <laughs> this was not his dream for her. He sees himself in her eyes, mouth, chin, the stubborn tight jaw, even as a child, and smiles for the first time today. She is short-sighted, but speaks a young truth. We'll take every back road, bounce over the deepest ruts, and still make it home just fine in her own time. This next one's called Peace Time. During the war, when you drove an ambulance between battles, you bought a coffee mill in the lull from a shop in Belgium. You could have stolen it, you who saw American soldiers raping a French woman on the train and took no part, no risk to stop it. You could have stolen it or paid what you wanted, a chocolate bar perhaps, but you gave full price to the man with his sadness. Did he have daughters too? You who detest coffee, give the mill to me, your youngest, now in midlife, along with the train story. There were three of them and nothing I could do. This is called Love, a Meditation. Daffodil, Narcissus, Blue Flag Iris, I stored bulbs in brown paper bags tied with twine to keep fresh, snow thick and falling thick. You take the truck and three movies, do not want to pay a fine, risk life and love for six dollars. I open the bags, imagine color, water over black stones in a dish, 
coarse sand and shallow trays. I buck and nudge bulbs in moisture, tempting root and stem. Tires crunch and you're home, catching tongue flicks, kicking snow in the air, stomping inside to rub my beard with your wet face. Two movies and delight in nesting bulbs. I write, love is a daily dying and a nightly rising. You boil water for tea, straddle my lap, deep kiss, whisper, we are not dead yet. <laughs> and this last poem is called Quarter Optional. The parking meter marks space to rent. 20 minutes for a nickel, 40 for a dime, quarter, optional. I question the quarter to my sister and slide the coin in. 25 cents gives nothing. We laugh at the theft and enter the funeral home, wondering what else is option. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for the poems. The next person that I'd like to introduce is the person responsible for this evening. Very good friend of mine, dear friend, who is also a psychiatric nurse. And it occurs to me that that may, may be why I have, she has found me to be an interesting friend. <laughs> Ellen Lord is a Uber who descended into the land of trolls known as Charlotte where she helps those of us euperphiles overcome our addictions and survive our traumas. She has been especially encouraging to me, probably for those reasons. Ellen just came out with a her first chapbook, Relative Sanity. And it's a beautifully designed book. It's for sale over on the, on the table. Um, and it's full of these wonderful, insightful poems. Ellen herself is very excited, as she'll discover as she comes up to read. Ellen, where are you? I lost your I find you. <laughs> well, thank you, Art, <laughs> for those wonderful accolades. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is uh, something we've been really looking forward to, and I'm so happy to see such a turnout. I especially want to thank Sarah Benitez over there with the library. She's responsible for so much, including the wonderful. <laughs> and um, we didn't know how many people would be here, um, and it's just a great turnout. Can't use the mic. Use the mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those of you that know me know that this isn't my forte. I don't even like to get out in front of people and talk, but I'm getting better at it thanks to Art. He's uh, coaching me a little bit on spoken word. So, um, as said, I'm going to um, begin with two poems. And the first is in response to our students um, um, about um, the creative dilemma that some of us poets go through the agony and the ecstasy of writing poems. And it's just a short poem. It's called Muse. Kind of. Muse after W.S. Merlin. Searching for words very early. I sense a kind of sign close by, like a rippled pond or stand of aspen in the dark. I am reminded of the mystery of every fleeting thought I have forgotten, trusting a syllable will surface in the depths of silence. Now this next one, um, 
is for outlaw women. And there uh, is a gaggle of outlaw women here. I think they're over there. <laughs> they're commanding the county and they're wild. <laughs> so this poem, there are other wild women here too. <laughs> so this poem is called The Biker's Wife. She loved him most when he returned from a long ride. Face windburn, hair wild, leather jacket dusty, redolent of back roads and cedar. She would meet him by the gate as he swung his leg from the bike. An outlaw smile would bind his eyes. On the field stone porch, she would pull off his boots, open his shirt, take the whole ride inside her, the bottomless sky, the hard road, vibrations of this rumbling engine surging into twilight to carry him home. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Ellen Moore. Again, thank you for getting this whole thing off the ground. And thank you as well, Sarah. And the library is a beautiful library, isn't it? Used to be a high school. My understanding that it was converted and the, everything done in 2006. And now it's just a lovely, lovely library with a lovely meeting hall. And tell me that they can separate these two rooms with a folding wall, so they actually have two rooms here. And you good people are filling up two rooms, and thank you for coming today. The very next person is a former history teacher in the Traverse City Public Schools by the name of Paul Maxbauer. Now, Paul has poems that have appeared in Dune's Review, and Walloon Writer's Review. I first met Paul when we appeared together reading works we had published in Poets' Night Out chapbooks for the Travers Area District Library prints once a year. Paul likes to fish, and given his history background, I understand that he is hard at work writing a romance novel in which Dame Juliana Burns who wrote the very first book on sport fishing back in 1496, returns centuries later as a ghost fisherwoman and falls in love with a fisherman named Isaac Walton, who under Juliana's loving nag wrote The Complete Angler in 1653. I understand that Paul's project is being funded by the National Organization of Women <laughs> oh, where are you? What up? <laughs> Brought some uh, books up here in journals that I'm kind of going to do this on the fly and read. So uh, first I wanted to say thank you to whoever is involved in Ellen and your group for inviting me to be here. I'm really thrilled and happy that I have this opportunity. Um, as Art was saying, I, I retired from teaching like 12 years ago, something like that. And, um, after 35 years in the classroom, I was really, all my life, I kind of had this urge and I wanted to write. So I got started as soon as I retired from teaching and I've been just kind of plugging away at it ever since. I, uh, I'm going to start with a book that grew up Oh, I had in the one of the chat books for Poets Night Out in Trevor City. This, this is titled Retirement. In winters past, I have watched anglers on the frozen bay 
with their sleds and ice augers, tip-ups and metal buckets. They sat on five-gallon pails with backs against the wind, watched barbers float in pools the size of soup bowls, tilted their jigging rods up and down, vigilant for a strike. I watched them come ashore, their faces radiant from the freezing wind. They looked happy to be alive, the lucky ones for dinner, a half dozen jumbo perch, a white fish, or a lake trout, that lovely char with its white tip fins and flanks brushed with ivory, olive, and yellow. In years gone by, it was me out on the ice until I was retired by frozen, frostbitten hands and feet and a new discretion born of age. But oh, to be out there once more, to see the rod tip go down, feel a solid strike, the weight of a large fish. The long pole of memory can take me back there. This poem uh, is titled Some Evening Visitors. It's one of the first poems I had uh, accepted by the Walden Writers Review a couple years back. Some Evening Visitors. Coyotes call to one, yipping, barking, and howling. They pause as if awaiting a reply then start up again. Their cries resound across the valley where I stand in a river and scan for movement on the bridge line, illuminated by the last narrow band of yellow light before darkness descends. The coyotes remain hidden, but I count myself lucky just to be here, to listen to the primordial school chorus reminded of my status as a visitor to this valley with an old and still unfolding geological history. They move on, and I hear quieter sounds, the sighing of alders and poplars moved by a light breeze, the swish of my casting, and the music of water rushing past rocks, boulders and brown trees. I wade slowly, my eyes adjusting to the deepening darkness, hoping for one more rising trout to try for, in no hurry to reach a landing. <clears throat> I, want to, I want to read my last one. Um, this, this is out of Dune's review. This, this poem is real special to me. I lost one of my best friends about a year and a half ago. He passed away and uh, we were friends for 35 years and he was just a great guy. We did a lot of adventures together and that's where this poem comes from. <clears throat> it's titled, For Dennis in Memoriam. In the late afternoon, we walked down a narrow footpath to the river through a thick stand of willows, aware that the valley we entered was frequented by grizzly bears, one being spotted the day before. We waded a long curving arc of the river, observed small mayfly hatching, tiny gray sailboats on the water, trout rising to them, and swallows working the airspace above. We happily caught and released many beautiful Yellowstone cutthroats. Both of us, it seemed, moved and casted in a dreamlike trance, so that we were surprised by a strong thunderstorm blowing in over the mountains. We pulled on our raincoats 
hunker down on the gravel bar amid the wind and pouring rain, like monks at prayer, hoods drawn tight. Dennis with a stub of cigar between his teeth, still glowing. Then the rain let up, the storm passed, and as dusk turned to night, the trouble began to rise again. Please forgive me for being so getting up. Paul, wonderful, particularly the true tribute to your friend. The next person, by the way, you have the biographies of all of these people. <laughs> I taught for many years, and I swore after, before I started teaching, when I was in high school, but I would never, ever read it from the textbook. So you have the biographies. I invited every poet to send me a little story about themselves so I could Separate from the biographies. I got two responses. And I had warned them that I would make up the story <laughs> if they didn't provide it. So you have heard lies about a number of people, and you're probably going to hear another. Our next poet is also an editor. And this gentleman has written a regular column called Literate Matters for the Potosky News Review for nearly a quarter of a century. Glenn Young is a man for all seasons. He guides summer kayakers and winter skiers. I do not know what he does in the shoulder seasons. I'll leave that to your imaginations. He is currently associate editor of the Walloon Writers Review, and Glenn has agreed to make himself available afterwards when we're done to any of you who have questions about how to submit to either Walloon Writers or to uh, any other organization. Glenn currently directs the Bear River Literary, Literary and co-directs the Top of the Mid Writing Project. Glenn, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, and what I can tell you is that during the shoulder seasons, I don't do nearly enough. I was realizing that today as I was looking at my lawn. Um, yes, I'll be happy to uh, talk to you if you're interested after about the uh, deliberations that Jennifer Huger and I conduct when we read for the uh, Walden Writers Review. I don't know if I'll be able to tell you anything that you already know, but I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Uh, one of the other things that I do during the shoulder season in the spring is um, double down on writing poetry because after all, April is National Poetry Month. And one of the things that Art didn't mention that I used to do when I was teaching was that um, I coordinated the uh, Poetry Out Loud contest at Toski High School, and we would get 800 kids learning poems, and then we would whittle it down to 15 or 20, and we would invite people to come in and listen to students recite poems. And I always was able to use this line on that day when we conducted the uh, final recitations. And I want to use that line tonight because I think it's appropriate. Thank you for being a part of the largest audience at a poetry event anywhere in America. <laughs> So one of the other things that I always did um, when I was teaching was that I encouraged students to write and I gave them bottles 
And not only did I encourage them, but I shared with them what I would write based on those same models. And one of those comes from uh, Robert Hayden, and his poem was called Sunday Mornings, and mine was called Love's Bricks after Robert Hayden. Sunday or any other day, what do we know of love other than the way it slides through the fingers of the heart like some childhood mud flung at the girl next door or the slippery constellation of the trout, iridescent and gone? What can we know except the blindness of looking too long at the sun or holding hands while the wax melts and we fall too heavily against the rocks of this day's debts and obligations? What I do know is its history, the slow accumulation of love's bricks, mortared by birthdays and funerals, anniversaries or the wailing of babies, music if only we turn our ears just, snow, just so. What I know too is the puppy's milk breath tang, the dandelion seeds on the breeze and the bread, bright red pulse of geranium in summer heat before the gray limp or the first snow. The flowers echo a promise of a petal harbinger of another green day. This next one, I don't know if this is true or if I just have not been paying attention before this year, but everywhere I go these days, I seem to see turkey vultures. <laughs> um, I was out walking my dogs today and there were six of them on a barn across the road. Um, in the yard of that same house where the barn was, I saw one devouring some sort of animal um, a couple of days ago. Um, my dogs are big, so I think they're safe from those circling vultures. Uh, but this is called turkey vulture cone. After a rain, a cloud of starlings in the wind. What mice or varmint, springtime or Armageddon, eludes the vulture's eye. Thank you. Um, I'll just read a couple more. And I was looking at some that, that came earlier. Uh, I had the great fortune many years ago because of my teaching to spend some time in Ukraine in schools there uh, working with their students. And this was uh, uh, an opportunity for me to discover a poet named Mikhail Bulgakov, who was a Ukrainian who fell under the um, heavy hand first of uh, Lenin and then Stalin. And uh, I thought about him and I thought about the people I met after the latest troubles began a couple of years ago. So this is one of those poems. At the airport in Kiev, before I made the gate, there were other women stacking bottles and sweeping floors and making ready for whomever was next in coming in. The daily rhythm of their labors unquestioned in times of simplicity and sameness. I worry now these women are on the road somewhere, maybe Poland or Moldova, maybe with children, their own mothers, some neighbors collected with a pack or a bag and the cat left behind or the windows open or the floors unswept or the cheese still in the icebox. I worry that the children are not ready for a new floor or a new desk in a new classroom. I worry and I wait with the world to know how it all ends, knowing that it always ends the same for those who flee. The broken rebar and concrete of the familiar, the shattered glass and dreams. Meanwhile, I pour another coffee, turn up the sound on the radio, and gaze at the hawks hovering above the field, the earth's axis favoring some and dooming others. Oh, here we go. Uh, some of you have heard this one before, but I see a lot of um, new faces, so hopefully you won't uh, 
judge me too harshly for reading it again. Um, it's uh, untitled other than the date, which is April 6th, 2022. Can we all agree, guys who do precisely the wrong thing at the wrong time or sleep it off when they ought to be putting it on or wind down at the moment it's time to get up are the reason that we pay attention in the first place. They are the sputtering four-banger in the sometimes sluggish wagon of any story, moving it uphill when the action is falling down or keeping it on track when we can all see it sliding off the rails. These guys, the ones whose shoes won't tie or whose shirt won't button, their guts too big or their toes too gnarled, arms in a cast, make us pay attention when all the pretty girls or the strong boys are showing off their store-bought chins while we're brushing the crumbs from our dingy chest. Our socks worn thin with holes and the wonder that our story will surely never be turned into prime time anything at all. <laughs> and I'll close with this uh, couplet, if I can find it here. Um, today was a, a very sad day for me in that I had to attend a funeral earlier today, and I was realizing that funerals and poetry have a great deal in common. Um, and it was a situation that was unnatural in the sense that this beautiful young lady was much younger than I was. Um, and that makes me very sad. Uh, a former student of mine. This poem is untitled, but I thought of her when I thought of this. Last night, no doubt, she prayed my soul to keep. As today we learn anew, this faith of ours ain't cheap. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you very much. The last couple. Of this next boy describes herself as a forest nymph embracing elderly. God bless her. What a what a what a way to phrase. Susan Griffiths had poetry in her blood. And it spilled when she was working as a nurse and needed a way to process the trauma and difficulty experienced in her profession. It may be more apt to say that uh, the poetry is genetic in her. Her brother, Gary Bolhauer, has served as the poet laureate of Duluth. I met Susan and Mike, and Catherine, and several of the poets here when uh, Gary was invited to a workshop and give a reading at the Jordan River Art Center a couple of years ago. Let me reintroduce to all of you our forest nymph, <laughs> Susan Griffiths. <laughs> I retired to the state of Michigan, the Northern Park, happy to be in the Central Park. Um, and after my husband died, um, I found myself living in the forest, surrounded by the forest. And my friends from Wisconsin said, well, aren't you coming back? And I'm like, no way. <laughs> and so this is one of the poems. And as I'm embracing my elderhood, I've been writing more and more, which has been uh, a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. This is called Crow's Call. Startled awake by a harsh, raucous call, a grating on my brain. Call, call, call. No rhythmic sound or robin song, no blue jay screech, nor morning dove coo. Outside my window, 
treetops decorated with crows, flapping wings, incessant chatter, and an obvious leader reveals the day's menu of noxious trash and roadside kill, raising cause to a louder venue. Each revelation calls for multiple cause of consent. Travel plans of open woods, empty beaches, a thicket of birches for evening greeting, affirmed by clamorous cause and rearranged seating. Life calls out for complete attention, to be alert to demands of the day, necessary tasks, resolving problems, and preventing unsuspecting contention. I would prefer a Robin song to lull me awake, from sleep to daydream to morning. But there's something about a crow's call alerting me to what is at stake. One might wonder. One might wonder why I sit here in the dark and in the cold, savoring my hot coffee, feeling the first breeze of dawn. I stare off in the darkness, not the dark of night, but the dark of expectation. It's the silence I love. Even the crickets have ceased their serenading. I hear my heart beating with the earth a lot. Thoughts slow, some sadness, taking in the whole of it. Existence, that is. Why we are here. How our, how our humanity needs fixing. How badly it has deteriorated and not knowing where to begin. Maybe we humans have always been like this. You know what I mean. So right now, I will let the stream of life run through me, not try to solve anything. Just be responsible for my own humanity, lit by the light of returning day. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. Contrary to popular belief, the 88 large white glacial erratics found in the Triple Ring Formation north of Traverse City were not placed by a Brobdingnagian tribe intent on celebrating the sun's position on the first day of the National Cherry Festival. <laughs> but rather, they were placed by an everyday home, dressed in a leather vest and a white rimmed hat, riding a poetry tractor with a bucket up front. And it was his dream to recite poetry and tell stories around a campfire while others suffered hemorrhoids sitting on those cold, ill shaped rocks. <laughs> Terry Wood. Formed Stone Circle 41 years ago. Every summer, Harry and his friends recite their poetry and their stories. Harry has done more for the art of recitation, for poetry and storytelling, for celebrating and preserving the memories of our elders any other Michigander that I know. Please welcome Terry Weir. <laughs> I normally don't use podiums, but it's here in uh, Andrew Gossage is in tonight's level too. I uh, do most of my poems by memory, but I'm a little off shape because the pandemic uh, retired me. Like 2020, but we stood uh, Stone Circle up again last uh, or 2021. Uh, for 30 some years, I traveled all over the country reciting poetry in schools. I just uh, work in Elk Rapids High School now and my granddaughter's school in Traverse City. The first poem I'm going to do is uh, based 
kind of like the elders project where I would teach students to admit, uh, interview the elders and then they'd write a poem or two in the elders own words. And I found it was, a, I'd take the, the recordings after them and then write a few poems when he failed it myself. And I got a lot of, I just really enjoyed it. You know, at my age, I, I pretty much said everything I, I need to say and I really like using what I learned in 40 some years of writing to help other people tell their stories. My hometown, uh, Marion, Michigan, the literary capital of uh, Osceola County. <laughs> they uh, they have a hometown celebration here called Old Fashioned Days, and most of the uh, celebrations are either in the two churches or the two bars. <laughs> Three of my friends were celebrating in the Horseshoe Bar one night, and it came out that one guy, Bob Blackledge, had uh, made out with Patsy Klein when he was 17. <laughs> so I got a call the next day from one of the guys who says, oh, I was going to meet him up in Boyne City where they're going to meet their old high school coach, Wally Dietz. And the guy called me the morning before the meeting and said, oh, you got to you gotta ask Bob Blackwich about making up with Patsy Klein. So I took a couple of tape recorders along, and the laughter was loud of the wind coming across the lake. And I asked Bob about well, halfway through the afternoon, what's as though if you're making out with Patsy Klein when you're 17? And Bob got real serious, and uh, I knew I had to keep her, so he started talking. It's called In Her Arms. I used to show cattle and sheep in different fairs. 1956, at the Cadillac Fair. Patsy Klein was singing that night. It was the summer between my junior and senior year. I had just turned 17. I was out in the livestock barn. This young woman came walking with her girlfriend down between the animals. She stopped and asked me a whole bunch of questions. We talked about this and that. I didn't recognize her. Are you coming to the performance tonight? She said. Yeah, I said, I like that gal singing. <laughs> she said, here's a couple of tickets. My seats were right up front. When Patsy Klein came out on stage, I couldn't believe the same girl I talked to in the sheep farm. Patsy had recorded crazy. She's got you. I fall to pieces walking after every night of your sweet dreams. Yeah, but that's how I felt. The concert was over. I got up and started leaving. Pretty soon, here she came running after me. Jeez. Where are you going, she asked. Uh, back to the barn, or maybe I'll walk around the midway a little bit. Patsy said, well, how about you and me walking around the midway? Jeez. <laughs> we were together a couple hours talking and walking. It was late. Patsy said, where are you going now? I sleep in the barn, I said. Patsy suggested, why don't you walk me back to my trailer? Fine. <laughs> Outside her trailer, she stood on her first steps or I had eye. I mentioned a good performance she put on that night and got ready to leave. Patsy threw her arms around me, gave me a big kiss and said, I'll see you next year. <laughs> I never saw her again. She was killed in a plane crash three years later. Rumor is I made up Pat's climb. She doesn't deserve that. A kiss isn't making out. It was her way, it was good. I don't know how old she was. I do. I, I looked her up when she was 26. I'm coming out of a bad marriage. About six years later, she was in another marriage. She had two little kids. And she was sick with the flu. And she put on three shows anyway in St. Louis, Missouri. And it was a bad night, bad winds, sure winds. 
Take the order not to go home. She ought to get back to her kids. And her plane went down 200 miles to Nashville. I was in Marquette, Michigan, uh, quite a few years ago. And I spoke four days at a young other program. I spoke at 2,800 kids from kindergarten to seniors out of high school. And one group of third graders from Whitman Elementary School, they uh, brought me in a bunch of little homes called Big Spirit Storm. And they were pretty impressive. That night, I had nothing to do. We were sitting up in a row for 30 some years in hotel rooms and motel rooms. And so I took each kid, there were 29 kids in Ms. Johnson's class. I took an uh, image from each kid's poem and made a montage or a collage of Lake Spear Storm. It goes, the waves are scary, pretty turquoise blue, the violent lightning flashing on and off like a jagged light bulb. It's a wild party, white caps of huge waves crash against the rocks like the old bird in the world, like the old star in the world. Oh, shoot, I'm forgetting this. I shouldn't try to do this. Hey, Amen. The waves are scary, pretty, pretty blue, with a violent lightning flashing on off like a jagged light bulb. It's a wild party of white caps with huge waves crash against the rocks like the beating of drums. Boom, boom. The big, beautiful white waves thundering everywhere against the break wall. Excited schools of fish struggling to stay in the clean and angry water, swishing back and forth, roaring in the storm like a wild spirit flying up over the water, like a laughing giant polished and plus gallant, marvelous waves pulverizing themselves against the oldest rocks in the world, laughing, splashing, laughing, like superior. <coughs> Whoa, when you put a photo on it, I could write that. <laughs> <laughs> Later, as nature calms itself and the sunlight shines, the spirit and the seagulls come out from hiding. Um, uh, later on, I, at first I sent the phone to the teacher and asked for permission to uh, publish it. She got a receipt lease for from all the parents. And then a few years later, Whitten Elementary closed down the remodeling because they had a building of a college up there. And the university invited me back to read that poem or recite that poem and then to work at the Peter White Library downtown. And some of those third graders showed up to say hi. And they were young adults by then. Oh. Um, one last thing. Since I'm retired, this isn't selling some more anymore. It's a, I'm giving a 70% cut cost today. If you want it, it's five bucks. Uh, I've got another one over there called the Abstracts of Romance and Thrill of Being. It's got a picture of my 17 year old mother on the cover, and my high school graduation picture on the back. There's 10 of them. You can have them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. I think that's wonderful. That's just, you've done that with children's writing in the Elders Project as well, turning the things into things. Most of us here are elders. And don't we agree we all deserve respect? Nobody's mm -hmm. <laughs> <Are we> slapping. <laughs> uh, I love you all. Um, Tom Connell, in his bio, if you read his bio, he says that he, he searches for book trunk. He doesn't fish, just looks for it. <laughs> he's very unselfish that way. You know, you can go after he's found him, you know, you can fish for him. <laughs> now, when it comes to lake trout, very different quality. Uh, Tom was captain of a Cutter, U.S. Coast Guard cutter on the Great Lakes, and used to set up a downrigger on, on, the, on the stern of the, of the boat and troll for lake trout. And 
they caught weight trouble. And that night, on that cutter, Tom would dismiss the cook and tell the cook, hey, cookie, you make the salad, I'll cook the trout. I mean, they ate very well on that Coast Guard. When they were in port, Tom would fish over the side for walleye and bluegill. <laughs> and if you believe that, maybe you'll also believe the fact that last year, Tom brought out an epic novel entitled Gentle Spirits. That's for sale over on the counter. Am I right, Tom? It's over there. Yes. And uh, Tom has written poetry that has been published in several different places. And books, he has a book, uh, kind of a memoir, autobiography on his website. And he is a winemaker. What he doesn't tell you is that he makes wine, the traditional method, <clears throat> stomping it with his right feet. <laughs> Tom, welcome. <laughs> I guess I should have sent the buy it all. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> uh, good evening. And uh, unlike Terry, I, I need to read my <clears throat> first. Uh, thanks so much to Sarah and Ella for putting this all together. What a, what a great evening. <clears throat> my reading is the title poem from my work in progress, a poetry collection juxtaposed with original artwork, which I hope to publish in the coming year. Just one entitled Secret Conversations. To avoid misunderstanding, I talk to animals. Many often reply. Reminded by the magnificence of the red-tailed hawk perched on a cedar rail overlooking this year's sweet corn patch, loaded with ears and spindly, soil weakened by 20 years of growing vegetables. A sign, the grand bird, regal in browns and white, came in the morning as dawn embers shone above hills hiding the eastern horizon. A tree frog with a cobbled voice lived in a hanging flower basket beneath the porch. Hummingbirds come to the flowers as often as to the feeder and particularly enjoy fruits of trumpeter vines, boldly orange, three times the size of the gentle hovering bird. The old yellow barn cat comes when I call or when he pleases for a bit of food or a firm rub with his sharp, killing claws, stretch, setting a hook into my soft skin. I fear I will react with anger pain. A garbled meow, a muted whistle, a call to the sky, a scream to the heavens, simply look into another being's eyes. And flowers, the smile of a young sunflower, orbiting her glow to glimpse the sun. Bright yet red roses contrast with daisies at the foot of the scarecrow. Yes, I talk to flowers too. Butterflies of many hues flitter about, briefly landing upon bushes, sparkling with sprinkled natural groundwater, as if called by a spirit. Tone matters most, a friendly inflection, scolding squint, stop mid step, watch, sit silent, wait. I favor trees like silver maple saplings with slender bodies dancing in the wind. Sugar maples in the prime of life speak while losing sap, not seeming to mind. In old age, when mammoth limbs fall in the wind, gnarled beauty remains, like the sparkle in the eyes of a grain couple, paired still in old age. Listen to white oaks, strong and true, grown tall and broad from solid trunks. I'm told roots buried deep keeps, keep the secrets of life. While firm, shapely limbs stretch, spread their story afar, a quest to continue in life. Green grasses grow cool and tall beneath the foliage, thankful for the shade. I whistle to the songbirds, though Chickadee and Finch already know the feeders full of sunflower seeds. 
Our wild but gentle rescue one watches over the farm environments, poised like a sphinx beneath a rusted sundial, while three dogs with two fawns carelessly chew out alfalfa and stones throw away. Neither deer nor dog move as I push open the wooden screen door to join the secret conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I had to look up integrative medicine uh, before introducing our next poet, who, although she has retired, still works as a mentoring physician dedicated to the practice of welcoming methodologies not traditionally part of conventional medicine into healthcare. I was struck with the parallel to poetry in that poets have welcomed non-European forms, such as the guzzle and the haiku into the sonnet and stretched the sonnet into a prose poem or defined its image in a shaped poem. Catherine Roth's poetry has been collected in her book, Unforgiven, Unforgotten, sorry. <laughs> and she is the co-author of the memoir, The Good Fight, a story of love, cancer, and triumph. Catherine. Thank you, Art. It's a hard thing to describe in the of medicine. Spent a lot of time, maybe 40 years, trying to figure it out. Uh, the first poem is called Mutori, and this was a word I didn't understand. It's a Japanese word. And I learned it as I was just beginning to start writing poetry about six years ago, and I thought uh, a, a young teen's description was, oh, it's like when you go to a party early and you just watch it sort of start to happen and you're uh, just not pushing and not hurrying. So I think it's a form of spaciousness. And as I thought about it, I think that's kind of what I'm always moving towards through poetry is the sense of utori. Utori. If I were the heron alone on the stone wall, poised above quivering waters, waiting, shift of light, flash of yellow perch. I would know more about the fullness and the emptiness of time. This next poem was uh, written after a visit I had in Taos, New Mexico at the Pueblo, which is on um, the outskirts of Else. It's called Feet to Sky. Just off the highway in Taos, the sun peels back the sky to this, the oldest living community in America. The Pueblo man speaks his story to us, gathered in cool shadows of church walls, hand raised, hat brim pulled down, squinting into sage scented heat. We are not used to so much light. A woman next to me begins to fall. Sometimes I am the only doctor and must declare myself willingly, <coughs> enter rooms alone, stand up in airplanes, restaurants, uncertain what will follow. Now I gently lower her to this hard packed earth and raise her feet to the sky above our hearts pour water onto my hands to cool her brow, wet her lips. Today, grateful as her eyes simply open into mine. And then uh, the next poem is called Baffling Silence. And um, this was kind of an ecrastic poem after a painting I saw by an artist by the name of Seamus Berkeley. It's called Baffling Sky. 
The sun sets saffron and violet over the green river. Sometimes you hear silence and the absence of sound, as when the chainsaw runs out of the way. Excuse me, it's over. Baffling silence. Sun sets saffron and violet over the green river. Sometimes you hear silence, not the absence of sound, as when the chainsaw runs out of gas or the ambulance passes you by. Baffling silence. The language of God, as Rumi says, like the color black that holds all color, a silence that holds all sounds. I hear it in the kitchen clatter and the heart beating in my stethoscope, the crickets of September. Do you walk for hours up the trail alone, cold hands cautious in your pocket, deny your desire to turn back again and again? till you reach the moment when the sun kneels, blazing into folds of river and land. Do you see the marriage of it all? How it includes you? How the silence is enough? Thank you, Catherine. Next, uh, is a very accomplished writer. He um, specializes, if you will, in a form called a hyphen, which in old Japanese form, there's a prose portion followed by a haiku or something similar to a haiku, something derived from haiku. Andrew Ryuza and I only met tonight for the first time. But we've had phone calls and emails back and forth. And I discovered that we are brothers by the same father. Our mothers were our vastly different experiences that shaped each of us into behaviors that cried out for a dope slap. And the dope slap came from our father in poetry, Jim Harrison. Andy has played a number of roles in the drama that is life, including but not limited to operating a Zamboni and preparing the cuisine of the Western Pacific Rim on the Eastern Rim of Lake Michigan. Huh. Andy's work has been featured on Public Radio International's Bob Edwards show, and in nine different publications, if he has, uh, he, I'm sorry, I'm, I lost my train of thought, please forgive me. Mm -hmm. He's, um, his work has appeared in nine different publications where uh, the, there are the best of analogies, uh, anthologies uh, for four consecutive years. Sorry, Andy, I'm sorry, I screwed it up. Anyway, Andrew, he's probably, he's probably wishing he hasn't, he hadn't <laughs> done what he has asked me to do after my clubbing, but he has honored me by requesting that I read his poetry tonight, and I will do that. Thank you, Andy. It is an honor to read your item. There's a word in this first one. The poem is called Life on a Balance. And the word is Koyanaskoski, which is a Hopi word for life on a balance. I lit a cigarette in the dark inside my camper while the wind blows fiercely through the hills and its stars. Koyaniskwas, I say to myself. It's nearly four in the morning, but I can't stop thinking 
about that old native woman with no indoor plumbing who had an eagle feather dangling from her crucifix on her kitchen wall. She said that when the Lord comes back, she will give him that feather and a bowl of corn soup. Maybe then Mother Earth's tumors will go back to being butterflies and she and her people can be people again. I don't remember she said anything else. Instant coffee. I swallow the crack of dawn. That poem appeared in McQueen's quarterly. In this next haiku, you'll hear the pause between the prose part and the and, and the haiku. You'll hear it. <laughs> I'm not doing my job. This next poem is the 2008 winner of the William J. Shaw Memorial Prize. It's entitled Lung Cancer. Like always, the janitor sits through his break with a cup of coffee and I sit across from him. I light a cigarette. It's Sunday morning and the two street sweepers outside might as well be racing each other. They can't keep up. The janitor pours half and half into his cup, but doesn't stir it. It floats on top, spiraling like a galaxy. I drink mine black. He takes a sip and stretches. He hasn't shaved in days, neither have I. He reaches into his pocket of his faded blue t-shirt. Out of habit, I slide my bit across the table. He picks it up, spins the wheel, making a few sparks, but no flame. He slides it back and then pulls out an inhaler. I want to apologize, but don't because I know he understands. We stare out the window for a minute in silence, and then he tells me the fox got his chickens again. Choke cherry blossoms, scent of blood sausage. Next poem appeared in contemporary Hyman Online, where I believe currently Andy's work is being featured on uh, this month. Poem is entitled Regret. <laughs> Recently, I've been telling folks that if I could do it all over again, instead of cutting the dirty ice of its deep scrapes and gouges for 10,000 young hockey players, to the drunken cheers and despairs of their warm, loving parents, I'd probably just be a simple upper peninsula amateur, whatever, and set up my musty army tent right on the ancient fissure granite at the summit of Sugarloaf Bomb, 407 feet, where, with my ass seen on TV binoculars and muskrat toupee, I would quietly wait to study that one star that flickers only once every 75 million years or so. Dark eyed Junko. It doesn't even know its name. Oh. And then one more. Mm -hmm. This one he sent me this morning. It's entitled Eugene. I'm finally going to give them a try, those generic cigarettes that were gifted to me last week by a Native American friend from Canada. An NHL certified ice technician by trade, he moved here to Northern Michigan after accepting a job offer to teach his traditional language to children. But he's already gone back because even in small towns, politics always trumps traditions. Before he left, he handed me these smokes, as well as some frozen fish sticks and chicken fingers. Behind thick glasses, his eyes beheld all things with an equal respect. Making a fish stick no less sacred to him than a beaded medicine bag. 
In fact, tonight, I will microwave those fish sticks and offer a prayer while devouring them, maybe even chant. After I'm finished, I'll step out into the light of the waxing moon, smoke. Coyotes will begin calling to one another across the cedar swamp, and the air will smell of smoldering braids of sweet grass. A hot ash will fall from my cigarette and be caught by the earth. But before its glow has completely faded, a handful of ancient ghosts will lean in from out of the surrounding darkness to try to warm their hands. Auto cries. I bend to great to stone. Please applaud Andy. <laughs> We need to introduce the next person and select what I need here. <laughs> Getting old to stuff. <laughs> Ed Tory disappears into the wilds of a UP motel about a week before beer season and doesn't reappear until early December where in his kitchen at the end of some road in Charlevoix town, he can be found making venison paprikash in celebration of his Hungarian ancestry and another successful hunt. Ed Turi is the one that started Charlevoix so of which several of us our members, it's a writer's group, and we meet once a month. In fact, our next meeting is this Thursday, in which I'm sure I'll hear about all my mistakes. <laughs> um, Ed has uh, been published in several literary journals, as well as some of the popular book and bullet magazines. He's currently at work on a dystopian, by the way, this part is true. He's currently at work on a dystopian novel specifically written to scare the calories off of those of us who are circumferentially challenged. Ed, please come on. Thank you. Thanks, sir. You're welcome. All I want then is to the gosh. Oh, wow. Oh. I'm not over. <laughs> uh, boy, Andy, you're a tough act to follow. That was wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank Sarah and Ellen for putting this together, and for Ellen allowing me to be here with her. <laughs> uh, this first poem is. Um, We're going to be reading at Poets Night Out. So if you come to Poets Night Out, you're going to hear it again. Um, and if you do come to Poets Night Out, I would ask that you would wear your best steampunk poets outfit, because I will be dressed in mine. <laughs> this poem is called Gods of the Firmament. Tension is heavy as the heavens dim. The audience awaits in silence their leaves unruffled as the headliners slowly roll in. A heavy metal band, gods of the firmament, start their light show, followed by loud rolling percussion. Then the shimmer of a swish cymbal sighing through the trees. Rain on the pond, background staccato, gaining speed, atonal, cacophonous, yet appropriate for the chaotic forest. Trees bend with the rhythm. Some snap their limbs as they dance to the energy. Soon, the gods play their last number. After one brief encore, they blow to another gig, a hundred miles to the east. 
leaving behind a prismatic sky. Now, starting in late 70s, my brother, my dad, one of my brothers, my dad, we started going deer hunting in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, we went to Iron County and we pitched a canvas tent in the Ottawa National Forest in the middle of nowhere. And it was some of the best time I've ever spent out in the woods with my father and my hunting buddy, my brother. This poem is called Freight Train Winds. Carry me back to starry November nights when we were young and tomorrow was guaranteed. When evenings were filled with boozy laughter and weather-weary bones, the glowing wood stove a radiant blessing on wind chapped faces and cold fingers not yet gnarled by age. The old man snug in his bag, belly full, humming some favorite tune for his youth, happy in this place, smiling until the contented snores. None of us knew how soon these times would end. The promise of next year's camp made the breaking of this one merely a preparation for the next. Of all that I miss, it is the freight train winds howling down our cut, slapping the canvas, carrying me into the inevitable that bring the tear-stained joy, the tear-stained sorrow. One more. This is uh, one of my first memories in my life. It's called Mom Drinks a 32 Ounce Blacks, 1951. <laughs> I'm four years old, sitting on the front room floor, my back against the wooden playpen where baby Christopher is standing along the rail, rocking and drooling. He lets go with one hand, stoops to pick up a toy pistol made of cast metal, drops it on my head. <clears throat> Big brother John is in school. Brother Martin is growing in your womb. Your husband is at work, and you are singing as you open a 32 ounce brown bottle. All of this I remember, but I can't remember any more specifics. Family lore had you screw, had Dad screwing you every day but Monday. Monday was laundry day. A welcome <laughs> reprieve, I'm thinking. How many ways can one be raped? You could sing, dance, draw, paint. I know you dreamt of another life, the artist's life. Dreams buried in a post-war suburban graveyard. I hope that beer tasted good. Where did you hide the empty? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ed. I met Carol Sanford almost immediately after I'd read Jim Harrison's earliest poetry. I was inspired, so I made it to a meeting of the Central Michigan Poet Trio, of which Carol was a member, along with John Taylor and Ann Bartons. They welcomed me, and we became a quartet. And then a quintet when a grad student bombed for the Iowa Writers Workshop, Matt Eckelberger joined. Now there are only three of us left, Ann and Matt, for writing elsewhere. Carol and John have a rich resume of publications and readings. Me considerably less so. Carol lost a son in the sky of the Regera, Germany back during the group's early readings. And she lost her husband, Glenn, a couple of years ago. Carol has shared 
her many chapbooks with me, but what I remember best were her, her idyllic poems about canoeing the Chippewa with Glenn from their home on the river in Barrie. Carol, I won't tell them what happened on those canoe trips on the verdant banks of the Chippewa. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, please, my friend Carol Sanchez. I have one question. Do you have a stool? <laughs> oh, it's not as oh. Are you all right? See, yeah, good. Yeah, it's very good. Thank right. you. Thank you. <clears throat> so my first real connection to poetry in the beautiful northwest side of Michigan was in 1984-85 when my husband Glenn and I just kind of stopped, maybe on a whim, I don't know, I don't remember, to Stone Circle. <clears throat> so we met Terry. It was a beautiful black night with fire and the stones. And I couldn't remember all the words of any poem I've ever written. Um, but my husband, <clears throat> who's kind of a joker, stood up and recited the Ogden Nash poem called Please. <laughs> if you don't know it, it has two words, Adam, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> My first poem is called Second Marriage. Minutes before we are to say our vows, my narrow belt breaks. My skirt shifts. I have no safety pin in my pocket. The preacher, his son, and the wife, as our witnesses, are the only ones with us. But I'm afraid my spirit will find its way to my hips. What a beginning, glitch, or omen. You keep a straight face when I whisper what's happened. Slipping a figure into the back loop of my skirt, you tell me, no problem, and give a good tug. The future looks at us. We nod. Our ceremony commences, and everything holds for three wonderful decades. <laughs> Brain cells. In California, Anne Frances took care of her old mother, who every day cross stitched lovely flower motifs on the edge of her pale pillowcases. It got expensive. So Frances pulled out the stitches at night. Next day, her mother, beyond noticing, worked a favorite design on the old pillowcase. She loved her craft. I think of this when I lose a word, feel undone. A word like plenum, which is how my furnace works. Or the latest buzzword like algorithm. Or something I've never owned, jube. One day, I misplaced spatula and went to the kitchen to hold mine. I felt silly. Some nights, words retack in my brain. And I write. <laughs> we haven't had any love poems up here. I'll hang on you now. <laughs> this is called Together. Near the Osago, in sleeping bags, zippered as one. We rest with our toes pointed downstream. Many decades have passed since we met. The star-salted universe slides through the night, and we are middle-aged and dizzied after a long wait to be together. In the dark, frogs call for mates, and a whippoorwill reiterates, you are here, you are here, you are here. Finding a way back. In October, one winter day, I drove as if floating through a beautiful white house, so profound. I could not see cars ahead, judge shoulders, or spot exit signs until it was too late. The tunnel of white, the silence of snow, a deep quiet in the car, 
all made me think of death, especially my sons three decades ago, when grief became a five-year journey of feeling mostly lost, until a map grew in my heart. It showed that my destination was to heal well. An aura of peace settled around me, a kind of self protection, a belief I would not be required to travel that road again. But heartaches keep coming. Friends suffer, die hard. Loved ones struggle with deathly addictions. Woe, glories, losses pile up. Their wreckage, the content of sleepless night. Yet I drive on through exquisite snow. Solar Eclipse. This wasn't the recent one, but 2017 and Idaho total solar eclipse. Mm -hmm. When the sun, excuse me, when the moon began to blacken the sun, cattle in the hayfield where we stood milled about, then formed a line along the fence and followed each other faces eastward as the air cooled and eerie light descended, they turned west, reformed, and marched. Some bawled when the stars appeared. We felt no terror, but grasped why ancient peoples believed the moon swallowed the sun, why Egyptians saw omens presaging the death of reigning kings. Two mornings later, 17 red-tailed hawks gathered atop a hedgerow of tall poplars. One or two at a time, they flew from all directions, weaved down currents in a cloud-free blue sky, no dropping down to hunt. Drawn to the mystery, we tried to explain the scene through any signs of behavior we could muster. I wanted to hear a myth of intention, how the hawks convened to decide whether we deserved to be warned of what we didn't know. One more. <laughs> so this is about a real dream I had a long time ago. It's called Dream, My Maternal Grandmother's Funeral. Grandma's funeral is in two hours, and I'm pleased to be asked to present. I'll read XJ Kennedy's Little Elegy, or my own poem, Gladly I Am Not Dead, or I'll sing a poem like a hymn. I must get dressed, but people keep stopping by to talk, and now 35 say they'll attend the funeral, and I, I have only carrot sticks for lunch. My son calls, Mom, she's running around with no pants on. My little daughter finds me nude in the bedroom. My mother comes in, too, and we frantically search for our underwear. Yet I observe how lovely our flesh is, Renoir-like, three of us, pink limp and sturdy in yellow light. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. They say we go we go way back. Scott Couturier, their next poet. I suspect this guy is related to Edgar Allan Poe, or maybe to Fortunato, who was handed a torch as Montresor seals up the brick wall in the cast of Amontillado. Or maybe even worse to Montresor himself. I didn't know there was a genre of weird, liminal, darkly fantastic poetry. I do know this, Scott's poem, The Lantern of September, has been nominated for the 2024 Rising Award. Oh, I also know this. 
He met his partner, Shane, by following the sounds of Shane's guitar. But together, they formed a band named Nefarious Foodies that they record in Scott's grandparents' cottage on Lake Lenoir, Lake Lenoir. And the only sound louder than theirs on the lake emanates from the bands at the Cedar Poker Fest. I won't hold it against Scott that he and Shane drown out the music of my ghost writing. Scott, where are you? <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. As I said, thank you, uh, Tom Conlon, for getting me in touch with Ellen Moore. Thank you for calling for making space for me at this event. Uh, I've got three separate poems. Uh, the first one, this actually appears in a regular publication called Literary Hatchet, which this is a magazine that's actually released um, in tandem with the management of the Lizzie Borden House. So that's the literary the hatchet. That's the title. And um, yes, I have been living uh, at my grandparents' uh, cottage in, uh, in Leland County for several years now. I love to garden my grandfather, who has been suffering from severe dementia for over a decade, and also gardened in that state. So uh, this is uh, tending my grandfather's garden. It's dedicated to I am tending my grandfather's garden, planting plots of peppers in a pear-shaped world, I am weeding my grandfather's garden where long lies fertile, overcome by grasses, green with maize fecundity. I am tending my grandfather's garden as he forgets and forgets the tide of forgetfulness more fathomless than any ocean's depths. Outside his window, nature germinates to renewal, yet he peers ever inward, seeing only images of another age. Here I dig into the worm's hidden abode, underbelly of all life's thriving cone, threads of white root torn loose, writhing larvae exposed through the spacious sky, strewn by clouds, brooding with summer's hot incipients. No cicada yet sounds its thrum, mosquitoes barely taken to bloodletting, trillium nascent, though snowdrops have faded long since. I am tending my grandfather's garden, as spring grows ever more granted, here where his hand once turned to life's loom, sowing and coaxing, reaping at last red ripe tomatoes for dinner's table. I tell him I am working his land, and he regards me quizzically, or perhaps with rarest insight. He doesn't know my name or his own, though often he will smile and say something letting me know he is still him. I who must tend this greening earth in a world mortal wounded. I who pay tribute to his busy hands, his kindness. Next poem I have for you. This is uh, taken, this is actually the 20th issue of Spectral Realms. Uh, it's the 10th anniversary uh, edition of this uh, speculative journal of uh, essentially uh, poetry, horror poetry, weird poetry, speculative poetry. Um, and the poem that I want to read from here, this is actually, again, it's written by a, a, about a tree that's just down the road from the cottage. This is a tree that I've known my entire life. For an autumn willow. Willow gilt with autumn's gold, forlorn gusts your bowers sway, last sun's light fading gray on leaves which weeping unfold. Willow with falls, favor crowned, drowse of close of dreary day, crows about your arbors play, woodlands around in fire gowned. Willow spread with yellow shawl, nothing can make summer stay, May a good six months away, sorrowful you shed your paw. Willow charged by seasons change, boughs blaze in sunset's ray, burning now. With colors fade, twilight falls, makes all things strange, wonder by nature arranged. Willow with your beauty bowed, moonrise and starry array looms and urgent your display. Auric laurels, you bend proud. Then 
my final poem I'm going to share with you guys. I wanted to know how far I should go into the speculative, the, the more horror, weird side of things. Um, I, I love autumn. Autumn is my favorite time of year. I'm never happier than when it's autumn. I write a ton when it's autumn. I love growing pumpkins. So, so this is a poem from me to autumn directly. Embalm me in autumn. Embalm me in autumn beneath an orange harvest moon, summer's waning fraught by season's impinging bloom, all beauty of life's bounty ebbing with elegance of swoon. Embalm me in autumn slathered in cadaverous leaves, let ground and grave alike. See, before me bows to grieve, a gast of winter shade, sorrowing his warm days yet to see. Embalm me in autumn, pricks and poignards of crimson crown, boughs of green, herbage already rotting brown, and cold rains roiling steady, skies with woolen racks, all glum. Embalm me in autumn, drowsy with September's dream, mushroom caps clammy, poking from my soggy seams, snails slithering to numb my tongue, devour my screams. Embalm me in autumn, each day eager, paired in breath, waxing night of wonder, as ages bygone, upstir from death, ghosts roaming roads and withered firmaments, further depths. Embalm me in autumn to a harpsichord's jangling tune, tied tight with cobwebs and bindings from the mummy hewn, fools attending where I lie to ensure my beer is crimson strewn beneath a weird and woeful sky, lit by a leering harvest moon. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Um, Sarah, how are we doing? Should I? I don't have to read. Um, I don't want to. They're, they're going to lock it up so we have the bathroom for the opposite work. Okay. So, uh, all right. Yeah. I'm only going to read a couple. I'm sure you've heard enough of me. Um, this first poem is almost like a song because it is a Greek chorus. And the chorus didn't come from me. It came from the gentleman telling you the story while we unloaded wood. So there are really three men in this poem called Michigan Men. It's for Jeff Fulton in memory of Rick Morris. All the while unloading wood, he remembered. Found him up near Goodhart acting funny. He was alone. Had his cabin and his dogs. That was all he needed. He had hygiene problems. Go a couple of weeks sometimes. Known him for near 30 years. My best worker and friend. He'd always show up before me. God, he was a worker. When he started, I fired the others. Never knew if they'd show up or not. I could have left my mall, my saw, my truck, keys to everything with him. Known him for near 30 years, my best worker and friend. He was always there before me. We talked between sorrows. He was slow but methodical. He could outlast me, had a rhythm he did, where I would race and attack and tire. He had a rhythm. We worked together near 30 years, my best worker and friend. I knew something was wrong. We were deep in the woods north of Goodhart when I found him. I knew something was wrong. He was acting funny. We'd worked together nearly 30 years, my best worker. Friend. Didn't want me to call the doctor, but I told him he needed one, and he was going to have one. I got an ambulance, told him I'd follow it in, told him not to worry. I'd be right behind. Last words we had. We worked together nearly 30 years. My best work with a friend. It was an aneurysm. He went into a coma. His eyes would open, but he never came back. 
But he thought he would each time his eyes would open, but he never did. Never came back. We worked together here through the years. My best work of the twin. Holy Fifty six. I'm going to read uh, two more, and they both derived from a knee replacement surgery I had last summer. And the first one is a serious problem, and the last one hopefully will last. <laughs> first one is entitled knee replacement. The patient information card falls from my book of poetry. My body has been read, and the editors found two stanzas problematic. Both needed replacement, but one had pushed the line that should have been straight out from the poem itself. Bowline, they called. Wondered why I had let the pause grow. They redlined the offending area and put me to sleep with their learned talk. I dreamt of simplicity of form, longed for five, seven, five symmetry, something easy to name, recognize, and use. In their dictionary of parts, they found word shapes of plastic and titanium that they fitted into what remained of my original word parts. I awoke in pain, could see the editing marks, could feel where their sharp pencil had cut out a dangling participle, shaved the gerund into action. Two days later, they sent me home to do the dirty work clean up the erasures, strengthen the muscle edited verse, the sinew that runs through the poem that is me. <laughs> this last one is, in, is entitled, Oh, the Pain, and it's a bit of doggerel. You didn't hear much doggerel. Oh, the Pain. I don't often complain, unbelievers. I'll say that again. I don't often complain, but oh, the pain, oh, the pain. Oh, the pain addles my brain. My fantasies are nearly insane. There's no hope and nothing to gain. Another dose of Norco seems really inane. The pain's in my knee, sore as can be post-surgery. What's there to do? Did I tell you? I have a bed sore too at the base of my spine. So when I recline in my lazy boy chair, I can feel it there at the top of my cheeks, <laughs> at the base of my spine. You're probably wishing I'd cease this whine, turn stoic and accept that which is mine to suffer, to see in the sublime, the gift that is life, any extension divine. In the meantime, let me screw Pollyanna and scream it again that I am in pain. After all, I don't often complain, but oh, the pain, oh, the pain. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all. And again, thanks to the Charter Boy Public Library, a wonderful place and a wonderful uh, service tonight and help. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.